Let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. As uh, last week, the Apostle Paul dealt with husbands, wives, uh, children, parents, employees in chapter 3. And uh, the, the, I think the guide to us in general in this book is uh, Colossians 3.17. It's a good guide to follow. Whatsoever you do, indeed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So always considering the Lord, even in this situation that we're in in the world with this COVID virus, look to the Lord. He's the answer. And now we're going to talk about Christian fellowship as we look at the first four verses. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So Paul's not ashamed to ask his friends to pray for him. Why do you suppose he does that? Because he needs prayer support. (laughs) He knew that. You and I need prayer support. Don't be ashamed to ask people to pray for you. We shouldn't be ashamed to ask for that. Uh, and he's dealing with a situation here where he uh, says masters. We know who our master is, uh, Jesus Christ himself. But masters, he could be speaking of employers. Uh, he's talking about, you know, you, you need to give properly to those that are under you. You should need to pay them appropriately. The Bible says that uh, a, a workman is worthy of his hire. Now, we have... Uh, He he says, do justly. We have a a master in heaven who gives justice. What is justice? It's getting what we deserve. But to us as Christians, we don't get justice at the judgment seat. What we get is mercy. We don't get what we deserve because of Christ, what he did on the the cross. And uh, also, I think this master is here can really refer to anyone with, with power over us, someone else, with influence over someone else. It could be a boss. It could be a government official. It could be a parent. It might be a brother or a sister. It could be a husband or a wife. He's saying, you know, consider what you're doing. Think about it. Always put God first. Always think of him first. Uh, we're always looking to uh, honor and to uh, uh, bless the Lord himself. And we should have an awe towards him, a respect towards him, because we're answerable to him in everything. Even if we sin against one another, it's a sin against the Lord. So he's saying, deal justly. Be even-handed in everything. And uh, he makes a point in verse 2, though. The the priority here is to pray. Pray. A prayer is a priority here. And uh, the idea is to be continually in that attitude of prayer. Doesn't mean you you shut your eyes and pray when you're driving down the throughway. Uh, you know it's not that idea at all. You can pray with your eyes open. You can pray sitting down, standing up, kneeling. Doesn't matter the position. He's more concerned with the condition of our heart than the shape, the condition of our body. But the idea is be be on the watch for things that need to be prayer for, prayed for. Be thoughtful. Uh, be circumspect. Looking around, keeping track, and just be thankful to God for where he's put us and the opportunities he gives us. And uh, we're to continue in prayer. I like what uh, Jesus said in, in Mark 14, 38. It's in the notes. He said, watch you and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready or willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, so uh, prayer, it, it takes endurance. Once we start to pray, distractions come in, our minds wander. It's kind of, some refer to it as like wrestling. Try, you try to pray for an hour. It's really hard, but sit down and watch a good movie for an hour. Time goes like that. So easy. But he says we need to be in prayer. Need to have that attitude of prayer. <clears throat> James addressed it in James 5.16. He said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman avails much. <clears throat> so the idea is keep knocking on the door. It'll be open to you. <laughs> uh, keep seeking. You'll find God's not keeping everything in mystery here. Watch with thanksgiving. And uh, remember, Paul, he's writing this from prison. So uh, 
uh, in fact, he in he wrote Romans in prison also. Romans five three he says uh, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. Maybe he said to the Lord, "Well, I don't really want to be that patient." Okay, so you can you can back off a little bit. Well, the Lord knows better than us. And he, when Paul was talking to the Lord at one point, he said in Second Corinthians twelve nine, he says, "My grace is sufficient for you." For my strength is made perfect in what? Your weakness. More, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wow. And remember, when we pray, it's really to get our, our will here on this earth oftentimes, or to get uh, uh, <coughs> our, our will done in heaven, that we can manipulate God and pull the strings like he's the puppet and we're the puppet master but it's really to get his will done on earth, to understand what his will is and to get it done here. Prayer isn't telling God what to do. It's asking asking God what he wants to do and what he wants us to do uh, according to his will. And we know that sometimes he delays the answer. I'll bet there's some things that I know that for me that I've been praying for years, some minutes, some hours, some days, some weeks, but some years. But... uh, uh, sometimes he delays, and sometimes he he uses that to increase our faith by continuing to pray. Sometimes uh, he does that so that we will increase our prayers by continuing to pray. And, and I know it's always to draw the, us closer to him as we continue to pray. But the I, whole point is to accomplish his purposes at his perfect time as we continue to pray. And uh, in verse 3, the, he makes a point that God opens the doors to share the gospel. You know, you think about it. Have you shared the gospel in Macedon, Penfield, Fairport, Palmyra, Marion? You know, we come from all over the place, Webster, wherever it may be. We have opportunities <clears throat> wherever we are to share the gospel. I know that uh, Pat and I have been blessed enough to have shared in uh, India and Finland and Sweden and Russia and uh, Israel, Uganda, Pat shared in Uganda and Romania. You never know, but it could be your next door neighbor. You don't have to go around the world. And uh, there are many church doors still open today where the Word of God is not given. They may meet ceremoniously and uh, they may uh, teach part of the Word of God. The truth isn't given. Ears are tickled. Stories are told. People are entertained. But we need to be teaching the Word of God. And uh, we're called to share the gospel. And it's true for pastors, for evangelists, for teachers. It's true for every Christian, all of us here. We're, we're all here to share it. We're to plant. We're to water. In other words, we plant the idea in somebody's head. Somebody else comes along and waters, like a, an agricultural a gardening uh, principle. And then God is the one that gives the increase. We know that. We also know it's not a natural work. It's supernatural. I can't do this. I don't have the strength. I don't have the wisdom. That may be true. But God will supernaturally fill us to do it. And uh, verse 4 says that we're to speak the truth. We need to be understood. We need to say it in such a way that it's understood, in such a way that it's received. The truth in love, not bashing, not legalism. You know, Paul, he was in prison. He was in chains. And he saw it as an open door. (laughs) An opportunity to speak the mystery of Christ. Now remember, a mystery is something, a a previously hidden truth that's now just divinely revealed. Now I've listed a bunch of them. They're actually on your note sheet. I put it at the end there because I thought it would be interesting. If you ever want to do a a study of your own on some of the, the mysteries of God, such as the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> the mystery of the sower, the mystery of the tares among the wheat, the mystery of the mustard seed, the mystery of the leaven, the mystery of Israel's blindness during this age that we're in now, uh, the, the, the mystery of the translation or the rapture or the catching away of the church. Uh, of the living saints at the end of the age. If we're still on this earth, when Christ comes back, he pulls us up off the earth. And uh, uh, the mystery of the New Testament church, that we're in the church age right now, uh, the church, uh, one body, one body, lots of places, 
that people meet, but one body of Christ of believers, both Jew and Gentile. And then in Ephesians, the uh, mystery of the church is the bride of Christ. And then here's the mystery. God has decided to live inside believers. Can you believe that? Wow. He wants to put his Holy Spirit in us through faith in him. Christ living in believers. Christ, the incarnate fullness of the Godhead. Not just a guy. He's not just a man. He's God and man. He's the God man. That's a mystery. Uh, the, the word of God reveals the mysteries of God. The Holy Spirit, not only that, the Holy Spirit searches for us and goes into the deep things of God. Many mysteries, once hidden, now revealed in God's Word. And we have this. We can carry it around with us. On, nowadays, on our phones, on our tablets, our computers, a lot of it up here, hopefully. Verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That means outside the Christian faith. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. How do we walk in wisdom? If we just ask God, you know, give me wisdom. I don't have wisdom. Well, how do I walk in it then? Well, be careful what you say. Be careful what you don't say. Be careful where you go. Be cautious about where you don't go. Be careful about what you read and be selective in what you read and what you don't read. And today in this electronic age, be careful what you watch. There's a lot of things we shouldn't watch. And it's so much there, you know. And guys, we have, we're easily stumbled through our eyes. And in the summertime when <clears throat> all the hot weather comes up and all the flesh starts coming out because it's so warm out, it can be a, a stumbling block to men. But be careful in those areas. We need to guard our hearts. Don't say any, as we're sharing, we shouldn't be doing or saying anything that would make it impossible for that person to receive the gospel message. And it also means to be alert to God's opportunities, to share his word. In other words, redeeming the time. Be careful. It might be in Walmart. It might be around a dinner table. It might be, who knows where, at the beach. But using opportunities kind of like a shopper or bargain shopper would do. First Timothy 3 7 says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. In other words, we need to be received by those who are outside the faith, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Now, I don't expect the rest of all of the world to accept me and who I am or, or you either, but we should have a, a kind of attitude in a presence where we can be received at least. And if we're, if we're born again, we're really part of the insider group in, in the body of Christ. We're spiritual insiders. We belong to God's family or this mystery of the body of Christ and the church of Christ. And we have a responsibility to witness to the lost around us, to bring God's salvation plan to those who are without. It's, well, they're without that salvation plan, but they're also outside. It's another word for outside the faith. So he says, you know, be, be wise toward the lost world. And a, a lot of it's, most of it's lost. Use caution when you speak publicly. Don't blurt things out. You know, try to keep, uh, sometimes my mouth will go ahead of my brain. You ever have that happen? The words are already out there and we can't vacuum them back in again once they hit the ears. But think first. The world loves wacko Christians. They do. <laughs> uh because it verifies their own lost position is not so bad after all, you know. Uh, we're not so lost compared to these wacky, wacky Christians. And we can't trust the media either. The news media loves stories of, of pastors and Christians who have fallen, fallen into lust or have a weakness for money or uh, they're misusing God's stuff, misappropriating uh, God's property and taking advantage of others. There have been those who sell dirt from the Mount of Olives. You can, or they'll take a big sheet and take it over on the, uh, on the, uh, in Jerusalem somewhere and stand on it or kneel on it and pray and then cut it up into little one-inch squares and sell it for only $9.95. I may have some in my, no, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, when we do, you know, you see these things and we like, we don't have the same ease of getting falling into those traps, but I look at them and I say, do they really represent the family of God? 
what do unbelievers think of my words, your words, our words, our public behavior? In a large portion of the church, as I said earlier, teaches from Scripture, may throw out a verse here and there around the stories there, but not Scripture itself. That's why I'm so blessed that the Lord had given Pastor Chuck years ago that vision to go line by line through the whole counsel of God. Because if you don't teach the whole scripture, you teach the ones you like and leave alone the ones you don't want like. And you don't want to address things like sin and hell. Oh, that's all yucky and dirty. And we want to say that all lifestyles are okay. God loves us all. He does love us all, but he doesn't accept all, all of our behaviors. That's a feel-good psychology. We, we don't want people to feel comfortable in sin. You don't come into church so that you can feel comfortable in your sin, especially if the person is lost and headed for an eternity in hell. They need to be warned. And we need to take advantage of opportunities. Use it to God's glory wisely. Redeem the time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The days have been evil since the fall at the garden when Adam and Eve went, doesn't look like a bad tree to me. <laughs> you know? Those without, those outside the faith, outside Christ or without Christ, they need to know that Christ came, that he is God. He came from the Godhead. He died. He paid a price. And he's coming to, again. They need to know that one day every knee will bow and acknowledge that Christ is Lord either before the judgment seat or after. And we need to know, they need to know that everything, every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord, to the glory of the Father. Time is getting shorter. It's, it doesn't say that, that, that the world will wax better and better. <laughs> It'll wax worse and worse. I don't know if you see any evidence of that out there. You, you, you probably wouldn't have to be too creative to do that. But uh, the time it seems to be growing shorter and shorter. So while we're here, uh, we need to use speech that's graceful always and uh, I know sometimes I can come across as harsh or rude, and uh, especially uh, linked to coffee input. You know, and think about it. You, you get kind of wired up, and you start firing things out of your mouth. And you, it's getting better, but I'm not perfect. Am I perfect yet? No, no. See, <laughs> there's still hope. <laughs> uh, so you know, and it's it's interesting. It goes into this analogy of seasoned with salt. I, I have to restrict my salt because of blood pressure, but nevertheless, uh, know how to answer things in a graceful but salty kind of way. Uh, well, we're because we're not always well received. Just be sure that the re, the delivery is not our fault. That it's not the way that we're doing it. Seasoned with salt means not crude, not rude, not harsh, not immoral, not innuendo. Because the properties of salt, we know what it does. It really picks up the flavor of things. We, when we're salty, it's, uh, it's so that our words can be received and taken in more easily. Salt's a preservative. In the biblical days, they would pack the, the meat or the, or the fish in salt. And we're, we're, we're called the salt of the earth. We can take God's word and, and hide it in our heart, and it, it preserves us. And the word will never fail. Salt is something, if you drink too much of it or sprinkle too much of it, what do you do? You get thirsty. Especially if the cap's on loose and you dump the whole shaker on, on your food. That's too salty. That's too much. That's unpalatable. The idea here is you, you don't want to put too much on there. If you have too little, there's no thirst. If there's too much, it's too harsh. Our goal is to create a thirst for God. And you know what quenches that thirst is the water of the Word of God in Ephesians 5.26. Salt improves flavor. It improves our, improves our attitude, our presentation that affects the gospel in the way it's received. Is it bitter or sweet? Does it cause a person to swallow it, so to speak, or do they choke on it? If it's sprinkled a little at a time, it falls gently. If you use rock salt in big chunks, it can hurt has to be broken up. In other words, give the word in bite-sized pieces that can be received. Salt also melts ice. An icy heart can be melted to become a heart of love. 
And also, when we melt that ice, it prevents us from slipping into sin, if you pardon the analogy. Now, salt in a wound, that stings. We know that. God's word stings sometimes, in the world especially, or even in ourselves, if we get convicted of something we're doing. It can prick our conscience, but it's supposed to. I remember somebody say, uh, someone was asked another person that they want to go to church. I don't want to go there. Every time I go there, I feel guilty. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, it's appropriate if you're guilty of something. <laughs> but uh, here's another thing. In order for salt to have an effect on something, it has to touch it. We need to be touching that world out there with the saltiness of the, go- or the, uh, the water of the Word of God. We must, touch, we must touch or be in touch with the ungodliness of this world. Our lives have to touch others before the healing takes place. In other words, we can't just stay separate. And the other thing that's interesting about salt in, uh, is the way it works. It's not apparent. It's not obvious. It doesn't make a lot of noise. It has kind of an unconscious influence. It's the same way the, the Holy Spirit has an unconscious, in, unconscious influence on people. And the savor of salt is its ability to, and our power to work. And to be salt, we need the power of God's Holy Spirit. It's essential. We need agape love, a superhuman love. Godly, it's unconditional. And it comes from a sound mind that comes from God's word. But what if I don't feel very salty? I mean, we can lose this saltiness. Second Timothy three five it says we're have a, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Many people who are calling themselves Christians, they have a form of godliness, but it's really more religion than it is godly. We even know the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is what we do to try to make ourselves acceptable to God. Christianity was what he did when he hung out his <laughs> stretched his arms out on the cross. We think that going to church will make us holy. We think if we have the right speech, it's it's the right speech is the evidence of godliness, but it isn't always. Sometimes we can we can have the right speech or go into church and say the right things, dress the right way, drive the right car, right read the right books, belong to some good organizations, and not have the Holy Spirit. That's good for nothing in God's kingdom. That's called religion, or some call it religiosity. But we can lose that savor, that saltiness, that Holy Spirit power. And when we try to work without it, the world can't see Christ in Christians. In fact, the, the Bible says that they'll, it, the word will be trodden underfoot. It, we can become powerless Christians with a witness reduced or destroyed. Paul gave a warning in Romans 12 too, remember, not, don't be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're going to be unsalty if we conform to the world in our actions, in our language, in the way we present ourselves. The rest of the world should be different. We should see the difference. And we'll be unsalty, so to speak, if we're complacent, apathetic. Well, I just don't feel like it today. Or I don't have that gift. Or how about this? Somebody needs to do something about that person over there. Somebody needs to share the gospel with them. Don't wait to feel like it. Do it because he calls us to it. You know, the Lord will sometimes put things on my heart that I go, Do I have to, Lord? Yes, please do. (laughs) Verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, who I am sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Tychicus is mentioned in Acts chapter 20. He traveled with Paul said he's a fellow servant. That means he's kind of like shoulder to shoulder in the ministry. They're working side by side. And uh, he could tell Paul what's happening to others so that he could comfort them. He could also be a comfort. comfort. Onesimus says a faithful and, and a beloved brother. He was from Colossae. He said he's one of you. He's from Colossae. This is written to Colossians. As I read this, I couldn't help thinking, you know, we have Bobby and Marty. 
came out of Bobby came out of our fellowship. He grew up in Fairport. He's now a pastor in in Finland. He's beloved. He's one of us. Remember Eric and Lindsay and all the kids. They're over in Richmondville in New York. Beloved, one of us. And this is the kind of thing he's talking about. You know those those that are close to us and they've gone out. Onesimus actually means profitable. <coughs> He's a slave. He, he's the one who ran away from Philemon, <clears throat> a believer. So Paul wrote to Philemon to plead for his life, and uh, he restored him, and he was profitable to Paul. Onesimus, once unprofitable, now profitable. It, it, it's uh, it's encouraged to, encouraging to have other believers beside you when somebody comes against you. And he says, as unbelievers, we were unprofitable for the things of God. True. Now we're profitable. Many of us, once in bondage, not necessarily in this fellowship, but around in, in the body of Christ, in bondage to drugs, alcohol, uh, sex, self, whatever it may be, now free in Christ. Dead in trespasses and sins, now free in Christ. John eight thirty six. If the Son, therefore, you sh- shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We are indeed free. In Aristarchus, he's... Uh, Says, you know, Aristarchus, he says hi. <laughs> he says hi. Uh, he was in Ephesus in Acts 19 during that riot at the Temple of Diana. In Acts 27, he was shipwrecked <laughs> with Paul at Melita, perhaps even a prisoner in Rome, certainly a prisoner of Christ. Marcus, now Marcus, John Mark, he's the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. His first missionary journey. Uh, Luke wrote about in Acts chapter 13, he was with Paul. And Paul said, well, you're not fit. He quit. And he went home. And on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wants Mark, and Paul said no, and it caused a division. So Barnabas and Mark went in one direction, and Paul and Silas went in another. So they had two teams. You you might think division's never good. Well, sometimes he gave them two teams, twice as much coverage. But keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Many fail and get back up again. If we don't feel able, it's all right. We work for a God who is able. He's able to take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Overcoming obstacles. A lot of people over our history have overcome obstacles. You ever heard the name Thomas Jefferson? I'm sorry, Thomas Edison. Did you know he was deaf? I didn't know that. Abraham Lincoln, you've heard of him. He was born from of illiterate parents. His parents couldn't read. Abe was a reader. Robert Louis Stevenson had TB. Admiral Nelson, he had one eye. So his death perception was off, and he was yet a great general, an admiral. Julius Caesar was an epileptic. Interesting. Louis Pasteur says that he was so nearsighted he had difficulty finding his way in the laboratory without glasses. And, of course, We know Helen Keller, she couldn't hear or see, graduated with honors from college. Got a handicap? (laughs) Go to them. (laughs) What it says is we're not excused by that. We just call on the Lord. Uh, No problem's too big for him or too small. He'll make everything work for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The question is, do we trust him to do that? Mark failed. John Mark. He left because he wasn't very useful at that time. He was young. Later, he's valued, Paul says, and he writes the Gospel of Mark. It's important we never feel finished. God's not finished with us, ever. Verse 11, and and Jesus, which is called justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he is a great zeal for you, in them that are in Laodicea, in them in Areopolis. Luke, the beloved physician in Dermis, greet you. you know, the, the early church didn't have any buildings. They didn't have a building they went to, people's houses they went to. They met house to house. <clears throat> the apostolic letters were ta- taken to churches, like Paul's letter to the Col- church in Colossae. They would take the letter there and read it to the people. That's how they, they got the word out. And uh, it goes on to mention some Jews, some fellow workers that, that co- were a comfort to Paul. 
Epaphras from Colossae, one of you, zealous for you, Demas. He was with Paul, says he later departed. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he's addressed. It says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed to Thessalonica. It's heartbreaking to Paul. It's heartbreaking when somebody departs from the faith. We do need to pray for them. Now let's close with the last verses here. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, in Nymphus, in the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. So Paul's conclusion here is to show us all that God has a ministry for us. We need to look for it, be sensitive to it, watch those doors when they open, and recognize it and do it. It's the only time Paul mentions his situation he's in. He says, remember my bonds. I'm tied up. I'm chained up. Many churches in Paul's day started in homes. Our church started in a home, our home. There were four of us, and it's grown and shrunk and grown and shrunk. Not important how many we are, as long as we stay in the Word of God. It's not important where we meet. It's just important that Jesus Christ is the center of the fellowship. Paul's concern was that the Word of God be read and studied in the churches. And this is our focus here. God works in us and through us to complete the good works that he's prepared for us. He knows what's around the door, uh, the corner, outside the door, this afternoon, tomorrow, next week. But he's prepared us by equipping us in his word. Stay in the word. The fullness of Jesus Christ is available to every believer. It enables us to fulfill the ministries that he calls us to, because as you know, we're all in ministry to some, uh, 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 some depth. But... Uh, <clears throat> We're uh, full of Jesus Christ. He's the one that takes us and puts feet to the word of God. And in the book of Colossians, we can see we have in Jesus Christ all that we can ever want, all we can ever need. All of God's fullness is in Christ. And we have been made complete in him. But it's no good to keep him inside us. We've got to take him out to that dying world. The word of God has power to change lives. He's changed all of our lives, especially if they hear the gospel from our lips, seasoned with love. Sometimes our personal testimony is the greatest gospel they can hear in an interim as they're coming uh, to a knowledge of Christ. Back in, a while ago, back in the spring of 87, Schoharie Creek, it's over towards Albany on the thruway. It was at flood stage. There's a bridge at Amsterdam that got washed out. It was night. Someone that was driving along there told a story of seeing a a tractor trailer disappear over the edge. They pulled over to the side of the road, slammed on their brakes, and stood there trying to flag down cars. <clears throat> the first car that came was a, turned out to be a, a, a team of doctors, a car full of doctors returning from a convention. And one of the doctors made an obscene gesture to the person waving their arms, and over the edge they went. Four cars, one tractor trailer went into the river, took ten lives. Long time ago. Who could have been saved? Don't know. Who was already saved? Don't know. (laughs) Who could have been saved from that tragedy? Not sure. But we need to ask, who can be saved today? We're not sure, but we'll have opportunities. We need to bring this message to the world because there's a bridge to heaven that hasn't been washed out, and it's Jesus Christ. It will never erode. It will never collapse. It will never fall. It will never fail. It's the only thing there is to take us above the flood of judgment, because we'll all be facing that one day. So pass it on so that others can know of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and pray. Oh, Lord, how desperate is the condition of many as we were lost, Lord. We're either lost or found, and a little lost is fully lost. There's no little bit lost, Lord. So, Lord, I pray we would have sensitivity to recognize those in need of the gospel message, that you would do that mighty work and use us in that mighty work to bring others to Christ, Lord. We know that we plant and water, 
and you give the increase. Help us to be sensitive to that in Jesus' name. Amen.